I'm Ben Gertzel. I'm uh, originally a, a mathematician by training, but I long since diverged from doing pure mathematics. I've been working on the application of mathematical and AI technology to a, a variety of different areas, one of which is biology and specifically life extension. And that's what I'm going to talk, talk about today. The concept of extending your life far longer than we're used to thinking we can live and the ways that AI technology may help us to achieve this goal. So this is a picture of me when I was uh, much younger and a lot cuter and had less hair and could get away without wearing my clothes in public. And that's my uh, mother and my grandmother when, when she was still alive. My mother is, is still alive. <laughs> But my grandmother is not. And I was about this age when I first realized that eventually I was going to be dead. And everyone else I knew was going to be dead. And we would all like rot in the ground instead of going around breathing and talking and, and playing and having fun. And that, I thought this was a pretty annoying phenomenon. And it, <laughs> it boggled my mind. Like, you, you people knew this all along. And you're okay with this. You just go about your life and you're, you're perfectly happy. It doesn't worry you that you're going to be rounding in the ground someday. And you know, eventually I, I reconciled myself to the idea, sort of, pretty much like everybody else does. I, I wasn't completely comfortable with it. But l l life went on. I got into reading science fiction a couple years after that. In science fiction novels, I found all sorts of exciting visions of immortality through drugs, brain operations, uploading your mind into a computer or a robot. Unfortunately, this was the early 1970s. It didn't really seem plausible to me that things were going to happen anytime soon. So I, I concocted a really clever plan. I was going to build a spaceship that could travel at near the speed of light. Then, according to relativistic time dilation, I will be able to fly away from the Earth, fly back to the Earth. About a year would have passed for me, maybe a million years on Earth. So I would. I would come back when death had been abolished and there were superhuman robots romping around and nobody had to work. I mean, it seemed like a good idea. Maybe, maybe I'll still do it. I haven't managed to carry it out yet. But what's happened in the time since the early 1970s is technology has advanced dramatically. And now it no longer seems completely ridiculous to think that wild things like abolishing aging and superhuman robots roaming the earth and all these science fictional things could come true, perhaps within the lifetimes of many of us in this room. My friend Ray Kurzweil, an American inventor, he published a book recently called The Singularity is Near. And he forecasts that by the middle of this century, he actually puts a date on it, by 2045, which is more precision than I would be comfortable with. But it helps make the idea concrete. Sometime around the middle of the century, he projects the advance of technology will become so fast that the human mind can't keep up with it. Imagine you have enhanced humans with chips in their brains or robot scientists making Nobel Prize level discoveries every minute, new, new inventions every second. It sounds ridiculous. On the other hand, the world we live in right now would have sounded ridiculous to Stone Age people, or even to people in the Middle Ages, or a couple hundred years ago. Th this graph shows Moore's Law and its relatives, the exponential growth of computing. And the thing to remember is the vertical axis is logarithmically scaled. So it looks linear on log paper. That means it's shooting way up. And we've seen that, all of us, during, during our lifetimes, the supercomputers from when I started my research career in the late 80s, those supercomputers are now less powerful than the desktop machine I use. And, and my phone is way more powerful than the computers I, I programmed on when I first started programming. If this trend continues, what's going to happen is that within 15 years or so, a desktop computer will have roughly the same processing power as the human brain. 
Within another 10 or 15 years after that, by the middle of the century, a desktop computer will have roughly the same processing power as the human race. If the trend continues now, we don't know that it will. On the other hand, it's been reliable since the late 60s due to human ingenuity, improving computer technology over and over again. What Ray Kurzweil does is shows literally hundreds of other similar charts. This is the resolution of non-invasive brain scanning technology. How well can we measure what happens inside your head without cutting open your head in the process? And again, graphed on logarithmic scale, you see we've been getting better and better at it. And if you follow that graph, you would conclude that by the late 2020s, we should be able to measure exactly what's going on in the brain on the single neuron level while we're thinking, which is going to teach us a heck of a lot. If people have not created advanced AI systems with human level thinking power by some other means, by that point, having so much knowledge about the brain, it should be possible to replicate what the brain does in, in silico of various technologies is just the end game of a long history of, of exponential development of technology. I mean, a few thousands of years ago, humans were living in, in a very primitive way compared to how we do now. Maybe 10, 15,000 years ago, it was all tribal Stone Age society. And we've had the invention of language, machinery, mathematics, science, computers, the internet, electrical power, and so forth, all coming bang, 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 faster and, and faster and faster each time. We're now quite privileged to live in a time when the exponential acceleration is, is, is getting so fast that we can see more change in our lifetime than our ancestors saw in, in say, hundreds and hundreds of years. I'm not sure whether there will be a, a singularity exactly as Ray Kurzweil envisions it, but I, I think there's going to be a lot of amazing and dramatic things happening during our lifetimes, and one of them will be clickers that function properly. <laughs> yeah, getting back to the theme of life extension now, the idea that there may be some kind of amazing technological singularity in the middle of this century relates to the theme of life extension in two ways. First of all, as technology advances exponentially, it may well bring with it technologies to extend human healthy life. Secondly, the idea that there might be a singularity in 2045 really makes me pissed off about the idea of dying in like 2040. I mean, you know, I'm 45 years old, so w w what if I die like five years before the singularity? Then if if I just lived five years more, I could have had like untold wealth and excitement and an IQ of 10 billion. But because I ate, I ate too many potato chips, didn't exercise enough, I would, I would miss the whole thing, right? I mean, that, that's a shame. So I, I would like to do something about that. I, I, I would like to make it possible for myself and everybody else to extend their healthy life as, as long as they can. Now, how, how can you do that? Well, there's, there's two broad approaches I'm going to discuss both very, very briefly, since this is a short talk. They both have to do with, with AI technology. So my main line of research isn't actually life extension. It's something I'm going to touch on for just about two minutes here. It's what I call AGI, or Artificial General Intelligence. That was two slides back from here. Yeah. Artificial General Intelligence, which is the quest to build thinking machines, software programs that can think as well as or, or better than people. Most of the AI field today isn't concerned with that. It's concerned with what I would call narrow AI, which is the creation of AI programs to carry out specific tasks very effectively, which is a really good thing, and I do a lot of that myself. But I'd like to distinguish narrow AI from AGI, the creation of computer programs that can, can generalize to new contexts and be creative in, in, in the way that people can. So. One of the things I've been doing is organizing a series of conferences on AGI for professional researchers, also open to the public. The last one was at Google last year. The next one will be at, at Oxford University in December. Then we're doing one in, in Beijing in 2013. So those of you who have some interest in the technical side of AI might want to look into this, look up AGI conferences online. And the approach I'm taking there with AGI research is not directly oriented toward life extension. It's more oriented toward trying to make a mind that's so smart it can solve a lot of problems, including how to make people live forever. 
the idea is to start with a baby mind and teach it and improve it until it gets smarter and smarter. I mean, I have three children. I've enjoyed watching their minds develop over time. I, I've seen that at the very early stages, a baby is an extremely stupid and, and useless thing. I mean, I, you have these kids, they lie there, they make noise, they wave their arms around, ah, 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 and then they excrete all over. I mean, <laughs> if you didn't know they were going to grow into something else, you'd think it, it was pretty useless, and you would donate it to the animal shelter, right? <laughs> right? But although they start out kind of useless, they, they grow up quite, quite spectacularly. And an, a, an AGI system may be the same way. You start simple, teach it, let it develop, let it learn and grow. The previous slide used to have a picture of a nice little animated game character, which we're developing in the M-Lab, which is a technology incubator in Kowloon Tong that's associated with Hong Kong PolyU. And we're using an AI system called OpenCog to control this game character whose picture used to be on this slide. Another project we're doing involves using the same OpenCog system to control that cute little robot who you keep seeing randomly pop up there, who is called, <laughs> there he comes again, he's, he's called RoboKind, developed by David Hansen. So that, that's one approach, try to make a general intelligence that's really smart and can solve all your problems. We're working on that in the M Lab at, at PolyU in the form of making the AI control animated game characters and humanoid robots, which are, are pretty stupid right now, frankly, although not quite as stupid as, as my kids were when they were born. But we're, the goal is to make them smarter and smarter. However, there's another approach which I'm taking in parallel, which is the application of narrow AI to biology. And what I'm doing is applying a kind of AI technology called machine learning to analyze data regarding the genetics of long-lived organisms. We're looking at long-lived fruit flies. A company called Genescient, based in California that I'm working with, they have created, via 30 years of selective breeding, experimental evolution, they've created fruit flies that live five times as long as normal fruit flies but they're created by selective breeding. So to tell why they live so long, you gotta sequence their DNA, get the, what are called SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, and the gene expression of the long-lived flies, compare that to the SNPs and gene expression of the ordinary flies, and see what's the difference here. And AI technology is, is really helpful for figuring that out, because the differences are subtle and involve combinations of, of many different genes. So what, what results do we get from applying AI to these long-lived flies, which we call the Methuselah flies? Well, a fly has about 14,000 genes. About 2,000 of them are statistically significantly different in the long-lived from normal flies. So there's not like one magic bullet, like, you get this mutation and you'll live a long time. Yeah, that, that would be way too simple, right? There's thousands of genes that are significantly different in the long-lived from normal fly population. However, applying AI machine learning technology to try to find the most important genes underlying this difference, you get a few dozen that are more critical than any others. And one of the coolest things we found out in the last few months is a lot of these genes have to do with the brain, a lot of these have to do with developmental processes, which is interesting because we're talking about aging, not development, and a lot have to do with brain development in particular. So we're, we're still unraveling the pieces of the puzzle, but it seems that aging has a lot to do with peculiarities in neural developmental genes. One hypothesis would be that these developmental genes do good things when you're young, but then they just keep on doing those things as you get older, which, which messes up your brain, which will be an example of what the gene geneticists call antagonistic pleiotropy. So one thing Genesian is doing with our AI results is trying to develop drugs. So if you have three different genes, and I can't show you the gene names because that's proprietary to Genetion, but we'll call them gene one, gene two, and gene three for now. We're able to find triples of genes so that just by looking at the mutations in those three genes, you can tell with 100% accuracy if you're looking at a long-lived fly or a normal fly. So that doesn't prove causation, but it tells you these three genes are interesting in terms of longevity. Then you can figure out which drugs target those three genes and design combination therapies you give those to flies, and you see these therapies make ordinary flies live longer. And we've gotten that to work in a few cases. Next step is to try those on mice and then humans. So 
This is one concrete approach to use narrow AI for pattern recognition to give clues to biologists as to what combination therapies may help extend life. Looking at flies, of course, can only get you so far because we're not flies. But fortunately, we have data about long-lived humans as well. And this month, I started looking at a data set from the Scripps Institute in California, which is called the Welderly data set. Now, these are human beings age 80 or over in really, really good health. And we've all met some people like that. They're like 85 years old, and they have more energy than those of us who are, ha who are half their age. So we've got... DNA from hundreds of those people compared with matched controls who are just as old but not as healthy, trying to understand the similarities there. There's a lot of neural, a lot of brain development stuff, a lot of the same biological processes underlying the longevity of humans as flies, it seems. So the next step is to look across other organisms, go further in the development of therapeutics. I don't know exactly how far we can go with genomics and neuro AI technology, but I, I think it's, a, it's an interesting approach that probably will give some benefit. And one concept you should keep in mind in this context is what my friend Aubrey de Grey, who has a very cool beard, <laughs> what he calls the Methuselarity. Now Kurzweil has the singularity, Aubrey has the Methuselarity. Now, what that means is the point at which, if you live that long, then due to the advance of longevity technology, you have a shot of living forever. So, for example, let's say a singularity comes in 2045, then, okay, maybe today I could take a drug that will guarantee I live to 2030. But then maybe in 2029, they'll develop a drug that will guarantee I live till 2040. But maybe in 2000 40, they'll develop a drug guaranteeing I live till 2050. But then I live to the singularity, so hey. So you don't need now to have a pill to let you live forever. You just need to have a pill now so that you live long enough for someone to invent the next pill, right? <laughs> and th th that's the Methuselarity. And a Aubrey has introduced that notion. He's also advocating a whole lot of concrete scientific steps for extending life not so much by understanding the underpinnings of aging, which is my own focus in, in that domain of my research, but by developing tools to repair the damage that comes with aging. For example, as we get older, ends and pieces of proteins break off, and these fragments of protein gook build up in our, in our body, which is not good. He's developing stuff you can inject just to clean out all that gook from your body. And a, ho a host of other things. His website, sends.org, is fascinating. SENS means Strategies for Engineering Negligible Senescence, which is a very long-winded, fancy way of saying ending aging. So last thing I want to talk about is my fallback plan. Now, if, if I can't build a superhuman machine, which is my life's dream, to build a superhuman thinking machine, if, if that fails, if my AI baby remains stupid and never gets as intelligent as my human kids, and if applying narrow AI to genetics data also fails because the biological systems are just too complex and drug development is slow. And if I fail to build a spaceship and travel away and come back a million years in the future, what's the alternative? Well, what I'd like to say is better frozen than rotten. I'm, I'm signed up with an organization called Alcor in Arizona. And if I'm unfortunate enough to die, my body will be rushed and dumped in a, a doer, as these are called, a vat of liquid nitrogen after injection with cryoprotectant chemicals. And then I will sit there until one of my descendants has the technology to either defrost my body safely or scan the brain and get all the information out, put me into a super robot body so I can fly around in the sky and have fun. <laughs> and there, th there's around 100 people frozen there now, corpsicles, I like to call them. <laughs> that, 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 that's, that's not their official term, right? And about, about 500 others on, on the waiting list, like me, except I'm, I'm hoping I, I never have to actually do it. So, yeah, things look a lot rosier, actually, than they did to me when I was five years old and first found out about the concept of death. I mean, now I can see I might actually live long enough 
to see aging abolished if Ray Kurzweil is right and if I keep taking my vitamins. And if, if that doesn't succeed, there are backup plans that are a lot cheaper than, than building a spaceship because nine-tenths the, the speed of light. So we live in interesting times.